Hey class, welcome to your second week of History of Women in Sport lecture recap of the information that was posted this week on uh, medieval, late, late medieval ages um, and early precedents to the United States of recreational behavior for women. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do two videos just to make them a little bit shorter um, so you actually have a natural breaking point in the information from this week. Um, also just because it, I have found that it seems to be a little bit easier to upload them when I have them just a little bit shorter. So um, I'm going to be talking about middle to late ages first and some early influences on the United States um, and through the strong women, the story about the strong women, the information about the strong women. We'll take a little break and then the next video will be about um, the early sort of activities, sporting and recreational activities of women um, when we first started to see that happen in the United States of America. So, um, to get kicked off with middle late um, ages and sort of the changing things that we saw in terms of the influence on women's recreational activities and behaviors compared to the ancient times, um, we started to see some um, changes in how women interact with each other. They tended to work more together. Um, I, 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 I want to make sure that we know that the Middle Ages are are the Medieval Ages or the Middle Ages, same kind of same kind of de definition of time era. Um, we're talking about 476, right from the fall of Rome, which is the end of the ancient era, to about 1500, um, which is like the early Renaissance era. So, um, and the beginning of the early modern era. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, um, we saw, we started to see women working more as a cohort. They were working together more. You should see them sort of group interacting more in the medieval ages. Um, but we also did see that, um, they were, you know, still considered inferior to men. Um, they really did a lot of what we would consider inexpensive activities, um, like dancing, running, tumbling, swimming, dice games. Um, but we also did get documentation of women doing some wrestling, so a little bit more of an aggressive um, activity for women, and of course an interactive activity for women, not something that is, is, is as singular as an activity, like dancing and walking and boating and those things that we were very accustomed to reading about and understanding about the ancient um, women and the way that they they sort of behaved. Um, I want to draw your attention to the um, the slide that talks about jousting uh, because that was a very popular activity for men in the medieval ages is, was these jousting matches um, and these tournaments that they competed in against one another. And this is actually where they feel is maybe the starting, the starting point of what we know today as modern cheerleading. Because the women weren't allowed to joust. That was very unladylike. It was not appropriate. Um, and so the men were the jousters. They competed. And what because we started to see women working together more in these cohorts, they, they did things like go and spectate together at these jousting tournaments. And they started to chant in unison um, in terms of supporting the men that were jousting that they were rooting for. And so they were considered sort of the first cheerleaders. Um, that's what they sort of, you know, sort of um, look to as the start of what we now today consider what is modern cheerleading. So we look to the medieval ages as a time when women did start to uh, work together more as a cohort. They were still considered inferior to men. Um, but they did participate in activities, typically inexpensive ones, like I said, dancing, wrestling, running, tumbling, um, swimming, dice games. And we believe that this is probably where women, we saw the starting of women um, participating as cheerleaders and why we still really think of it traditionally as a female activity or a female um, effort. Uh, you know, it's still, we still have this feeling as a society that it's strange to have male cheerleaders. If you look across the board, right, at professional leagues that have cheerleaders on their sidelines, there is not a male to be found. It's very rare that you see men in those roles. It is pretty much a, a pretty much a strict female um, domain. And so um, we, we kind of do look at that as being something because of the, the era in which we think cheerleading started for women. Um, and it being a pretty much an exclusive female activity at these jousting events, why it is really deemed a very feminine and female-oriented 
um, activity today in today's era. Um, so one of the um, particular women I want to talk about from the Middle Ages is Dame Juliana Berners. Um, she is um, she was a woman who um, wrote the treatise on fishing uh, fishing with an angle. It was an actual instructional book on fishing, hawking, um, hunting, uh, the all these types of activities that really were considered um, very uh, sort of male dominated or masculine. Um, but it was something that uh, that Juliana Berners became very <clears throat> adept at and wanted to write essentially an instruction book on it. Um, uh, Jame, Dame Juliana Berners was a, a prioress um, at a priory near St. Albans. And so this book that she wrote, the treatise um, of fishing with an angle, was from the book of St. Albans. And it's the first known instructional essay on how to fish and, like I said, hawking and hunting. Um, and she was believed to uh, have been raised as in a like a courtship life, but she went on to a life of religion, um, and she maintained through her life, uh, her sort of life in this religious realm, her love of hawking and hunting and fishing and all these sort of outdoor activities, again, that were mostly male-dominated, um, but she became so good at these activities that she wanted to write this instructional manual for them. And so she is um, noted as the first female to write instructional essay or instructional manual on these gamesmanship activities that, um, again, were traditionally male dominated, but that she was very good at and adept at and then wanted to create uh, sort of instructional pamphlet, manual, brochure, essay, however you want to sort of coin it, um, on, uh, so that other people could learn how to do these activities as well. Um, so she's a very prominent woman to know from the Middle Ages, Dame Juliana Berners, Treatise of Fishing with an Angle from the Book of St. Albans. Um, <clears throat> it's, a again, a very important essay to know um, and a very important woman to know because we see for the first time a woman giving instructions on an activity that is considered more of a, a masculine activity um, performed, in her case, by a woman, and not only performed by a woman, but in, in being instructed by a woman. Um, so when we when we leave um, the story of Dame Juliana Berners, we head into the late um, middle and early modern era, our ages, um, and then we're talking about the 1500 to about the 1800s. Um, we started to see that women were starting to push domestic roles. Um, they had to help with economic stability in their homes, and so we started to see that was one of the reasons women started to sort of push this idea of what really it meant to be female and a woman in a in a domestic setting and environment. Um, we did also start to see a shift in how women interacted with one another physically because they started to participate in what we would consider more like team-like sports. So mob ball, stool ball, um, these are these are activities that are um, considered more like team-like sports. Now mob ball is like modern day football, American football. Um, <clears throat> and um, stool a stool ball is more like cricket um, and so they so it required a lot of people to participate right they had you know the two sides competing against each other um, and so it was you know it was something that obviously a lot of people could participate in and that created uh, the sense of community with these women who um, played together um, and so you know they carried over these activities that they typically that they typically considered a, a female like standard female activities like you know running ball games um, swimming dancing bowling um, but then they added these other team sort of activities um, that they would do together uh, as part of the recreational habits so that was a nice shift and change that we saw in what the females were participating in and taking taking part in um, in their activities. Uh, in your PowerPoint, you'll see illustrations, a documentation of women participating in these activities, and that's how we do know that they did some of these activities um, in their free time and their pastime together. 
Um, and there is sort of an indication that maybe there was some mixed uh, competition or participation, mixed gender participation or mixed sexes, um, but there isn't a lot of like written documentation of that. Um, but we can tell from some of the illustrations that have that the activities documented that maybe there's some sort of like, you know, interaction of men, men and women together participating in these types of activities. Um, so much like we talked about Dame Juliana Berners in the medieval ages, we need to talk about Mary, Queen of Scots, um, as part of the early modern ages. Um, and she is important because, um, while she was the Queen Regnant of Scotland um, and the Queen Consort from, of France at different times in her life, she was an avid golfer. She was active um, in golfing and she a, a really, um, you know, is known and, and to be quite a um, avid and good golfer. Um, she they they considered her to be the person that coined the term caddy because she called the assistants that helped her on the course her cadets. And so um, they, um, and, the, and those cadets were the ones that carried the, club for, the clubs for royalty um, on the different courses that they participated in. And that this course was no different um, for uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. And so she is, she's um, credited for coining that term, um, caddy. Uh, so that's one of the things that we sort of um, attribute to her uh, and because of her um, connection to the game of golf. But the other thing that we contribute to her, uh, attribute to her, sorry, and is really the more important thing um, is her helping to build the the um, old St. Andrew's Golf Course in Scotland. Um, and and this is obviously very notable because St. Andrew's Golf Course is one of the most historic and known, well-known golf courses in the world, if not one of the most well-known, iconic um, sport venues in the world. Um, and she, that course was built during her reign. Um, and so, um, you know, it's ironic because Old St. Saint, Old Saint Andrew's Golf Course um, didn't allow women to play and participate or even come and, and enter St. Andrew's Golf Course. Um, even up until like, I think it was 2007 was the first time they had a woman participate in any kind of championship on old St. Andrews golf course. There was a new course that was built, um, in the late or mid to late 1800s that was considered, um, the first ladies golf club. Um, but it is really ironic that this, this iconic and well-known golf course, um, uh, that it, that was built during Mary Queen of Scots reign and really she was sort of the driving force behind it being built didn't allow women to participate um, or even enter its grounds for many many years um, hundreds of years really from the time it was was built um, and then uh, when it did it was um, it was because they built another alternative course that was just for women um, and so again it wasn't until sort of the um, about 2007 when they allowed women and they held a first women's championship at old St. Andrew's golf course. There was even like until recently, there was actually a sign that they had kept up, up behind the clubhouse. Um, that was a sign that actually said, um, no dogs or women allowed on the course <laughs> at old St. Andrew's course. Um, so it was sort of a relic, uh, and what was sort of a hearkening to what, how they used to see um, the women's role at Old St. Andrew's Golf Course. Um, so Mary Queen of Scots, known for coining the term cadet and known for being a driving force behind the building of um, the construction of the development of this Old St. Andrew's Golf Course. Um, so other um, sort of influences on um, the development of recreational activities in the United States really have to do with what was happening, um, things that were going on, particularly in Europe, because that's what tended to influence um, and impact the activity level and the things that women in the United States became accustomed to. Um, so we want to look at the early precedents in the United States by looking at um, influences from European um, culture um, that that sort of made those 
tended to what help help that shift happen in the United States for women in their recreational and sporting activities. Um, so we we saw in the 17th and 18th century very common um, activities for women in in Europe um, were things like tennis, pay may, battle door and shuttlecock. I'm going to talk about these things in a moment. Um, horseback riding, ballooning. And so these activities uh, that women participated in, number one, was a shift in what was sort of the traditional activities for women to do. But number two, became um, became actually, you know, the influences on what early recreational um, habits we saw in women in the United States of America. Um, so tennis, um, there's there's actually a documentation of the first woman playing real tennis in Paris in about 1421. Her name actually wasn't documented. Um, it was just documented as woman. I mean, she was just labeled woman um, participant. But it is a documentation that a woman was playing real tennis in Paris in 19... I'm sorry, 1421. Um it was documented to say that she was better than half of her opponents, and obviously all of her opponents were men, so she was better than half the men that participated at that time um, on the courts in Paris. Um, uh, but uh, that form of tennis, real tennis, I mean, it was actually called real tennis, um, is believed to have been played by hand. Um, and so in Britain... I'm sorry, the the brand of tennis, not real tennis, but the brand of tennis... Um, yeah, and the, the brand of tennis, real tennis, um, w was coined in Britain. Sorry, the, the tennis that was played in France um, was the tennis that they felt like was probably played by hand. And that was the, that was the one that the, the woman in 1421 was documented as having played. Um, so I'm sorry I was calling it real tennis before, but actually it was tennis um, in France at the time was really a version that was played with your hands. So a little bit more like handball um, as opposed to as opposed to the tennis that we know today. Um, but they did call the game of tennis that we know today real tennis was developed in Britain. Um, and, you know, it was um, it was certainly a, a game that was tip, at first more of like a royal game, um, but it grew popular and competitions began to be held all over Europe. Um, and so we started to see that uh, there's there is clear um, indications that women really started to pick up and play in the 17th, late 17th and early 18th century, this sport. Um, and so the first lawn tennis club was formed in 1875 in England. And we do believe that women were um, fairly regular in terms of playing at the all, um, the tennis club, the lawn tennis club in England um, in the mid to late 1800s. Um, Pay May was um, originated in France, um, and it means ball and mallet, and they used these sort of crude mallets to knock balls through hoops that were made out of bent willow branches. So if you think about what that looks like, um, you know, a mallet and a ball that you hit through these um, little little archways uh, made out of wi uh, willow branches, then you probably are thinking, oh, that sounds a lot like croquet. And it really was. It was sort of the early version or the ancestral version of the game croquet that we know. Um, and um, Pay May was the French version of that. Um, in England, it was called Pele Mele. And um, and then Pall Mall was what eventually it was called more regularly. And then in America, we called it croquet. Um, but that was definitely an activity that women participated in in Europe, in France, in Britain, um, and many other countries across the European um, continent. Uh, and then Battledore and Shuttlecock, this is uh, probably another um, sport that you actually know better than you might think, and not maybe so much by the name that it was traditionally called, but this is played with two persons and rack, small rackets and a little battle, um, battle door that is made out of um, parchment and... Um, and um, I'm sorry, battle doors that are made out of parchment and rows of um, got stretched across wooden frames. That's the racket part. And then the shuttlecock um, was sort of like a cork 
and trimmed feathers that were um, fit around the cork. Um, and so that probably to you, you know, hitting this sort of, um, hitting the shuttlecock across this net, um, two people going back and forth, that probably sounds a lot like badminton to you. And that's exactly what we in America um, call that shuttle, battle door and shuttlecock is badminton. Um, so we know that sport is badminton and that was definitely, again, another sport that women tended to play in the 17th and 18th century across Europe. Horseback racing um, was definitely starting to grow in terms of women participation. The first well-known female jockey to race, to actually race, was Alicia Maynell. Um, Alicia, I'm sorry, Alicia Maynell. Um, she, um, the first race she competed in was in a four-mile racetrack in York, England. Um, uh, her first competition was probably, they think, in the late 1700s, maybe as late as like the early 1800s, 1804, Um And she actually became the only woman known and documented and listed in the records of the England's Jockey Club to have raced um, and actually won against men until about 1940. So it was a long time before we saw another woman um racing. Now, women were horseback riding. This was very common and normal, but it was much more recreationally or sort of like, you know, as a habit, um, or as, I'm sorry, not a habit, as a hobby. Um, but Alicia Minnell, uh, was certainly the first well-known, well-known female jockey to race, um, and to beat her male counterparts that she was racing against. And speaking of well-known women, um, and their abilities, you know, and their abilities like Alicia Minnell, we also know of two women who were really um, accomplished ballooners. Um, and so ballooning was really popular for women, particularly in the 18th century to the early 19th century. Um, Elizabeth Thibault of Lyon, France, um, was the first woman to soar in a hot air balloon. Um, and and um, and then another French woman, Jeannie La Brosse, La Brosse made a, her first made the first solo balloon flight in 1798. But the most notable woman um, ballooner was a French woman um, by the name of um, Sophie Blanchard. Um, she, she pretty much between the years of 1805 and 1819 made 67 gas-powered balloon flights in Europe. Um, she, she was actually officially appointed the aeronaut of the empire by Napoleon which was quite a prestigious honor. Um, she was very accomplished, very, really kind of a natural in the air, um, and very good at ballooning. And again, it was a sort of common female. It was really actually really popular for women in the 18th and 19th century. But um, Sophie Blanchard was really a phenomenal um, uh, ballooner. And so, uh, you know, obviously was recognized for, for her accomplishments with that by being named the official aeronaut by the emperor, umpire, um, by Napoleon. Um, so pretty amazing, pretty impressive. So those activities, tennis, pay, may, um, croquet, um, shuttle court, uh, battle door and shuttlecock, um, badminton, horseback riding, ballooning, these were all influences on um, early recreational habits by women in the United States of America because it really demonstrated to women that they could do these things. They could be physically active, they could do things that were pretty um, demanded quite a lot of like focus, concentration, discipline, strength. They could do, um, you know, things in group, sort of in a group setting, or they could do them individually. They could do them and compete against men and beat them. I mean, all of these things that were happening in Europe uh, certainly made their um, impressions on women in the United States when they started to take on recreational and athletic um, activities of their own. Um, so those are important things to know. Um, Alicia Minnell, Elizabeth Tibble, Tibble, and um, Sophie Blanchard are names that you should probably be aware of and know and know why they are important and what activities, what sports that they were a part of. Um, the sort of last big thing I want to talk about with influences on um, early American recreational habit um, is from the Victorian age and 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 to talk about boxing um boxing was actually a really um a very uh obviously like very physical activity um one that we probably wouldn't typically consider 
if we wanted to use the classifications of feminine and masculine. Um, but it was um, something that we started to see in the Victorian age, which was about 1830s, 30s, like 1835 to about the 1900s. That was considered the Victorian age um, in England. We saw <clears throat> um, female combatants were women who were like really mentally tough. They had typically very little to lose. Um, you know, they were probably already treated like prostitutes and were lower class women um, and who, who were treated terribly in general anyway. And so boxing for them was sort of the way out for them um, out of that lifestyle. Um, they had a, women boxers had a lot of pride um, and they really had sort of this goddess mentality. Uh, and so they learned to have a lot of like confidence and pride in themselves when they trained as boxers and fought as boxers. Um, it was something that uh, <clears throat> when women did box in this era, they actually um, were, it was sort of more extreme than ring boxing that we know of today. It was actually probably a little bit more like mixed martial arts because they they really could sort of fight any way that they they could. They could punch, they could use their feet, um, they could use their knees so they could kick or they could lift um, the other woman off the mat. I mean, they did, they fought in all different kinds of ways. They could maul, scratch, throw you. Um, there was oftentimes lots of injuries to the fighters. Um, but it was something that um, became very like intense and interesting to people was to see these women combatants. It was almost kind of like the allure of female gladiators, the gladiatrices, because we started to see, um, people were like really intrigued are women able to do this kind of physical exertion and like actual physical contact with one another, um, you know, and put themselves in these sort of like sweaty, bloody, bare breasted com combatant situations. Um, and you know, so what ended up happening was there was, there tended to be just crowds of men, um, <clears throat> you know, watching and betting on the outcome of how these women would compete and fight against one another. So it became a pretty popular activity um, that we saw women participate in. Um, probably the most famous female boxer during this era was Elizabeth Wilkinson Boop Stokes. Um, she was probably the most popular um, or famous of all the female boxers um, in London. Um, she, <clears throat> um, she was known for fighting with not only like every kind of sort of physical uh, um, approach that you could think of, but um, she also tended to use weapons as well. Um, so again, we, you know, we, um, we think of maybe that their boxing was a little bit more like our contemporary MMA, you know, mixed martial arts. Um, and they really found places to fight in any kind of corner they could, you know, it could have been like fighting in the streets. They could have fought in sport arenas, theaters. Um, and eventually they didn't just fight women to woman. They would fight women and men. Um, and again, they became sort of just a, kind of an open ended, you know, it's really just fighting to fight, not even boxing. I mean, it started out as sort of a, the idea of boxing, but again, with the ability to bring in weapons and use any kind of like sort of physical approach to um, striking your opponent that you can think of, it was something that sort of expanded beyond what our traditional thought of boxing might be. So again, Elizabeth Wilkinson Stokes, the most well-known female boxer, um, boxing having grown in popularity during the Victorian age, which is again, 1937, 35, 37 to the early 1900s. Um, and so this was, you know, this was a big shift in terms of what women when they started to see this happening, like, well, what women can do and for a woman to think that way and for men to think that way. Um, so you can, when you look at your slideshow, you'll see, um, a video, um, that you can click on. It's a, a link to a video that is about Victorian women. So you can see sort of some other interesting, like fitness exercise and gymnastics activities of women in the Victorian era when you watch that little um, link, then when you click on that link and watch that video. Um, so I think that it's great to talk about boxing and then end this sort of section talking about strong women. Um, and this actually, um, you read, you read an article and you looked at some videos and you read 
um, some things specifically about strong, specifically about strong women. Um, and you read about uh, three particular people in your readings, Athleta, Sanguina, and Volcana. These are three of probably the more famous strong women um, in um, the era of, of, of strong women. Um, so, you know, I always am curious what you think of, what do you think when you read that, you know, read that primary article, Sisterhood of Strength, what you think of um, women and how they performed and um, why men enjoyed it. You know, what, what was it about these women that men enjoyed? Because, you know, you really think about sort of the traditional image of women and what men tended to like, and they didn't want to see them physically exert themselves, certainly. And, of course, if they didn't want to see that, they certainly didn't want to see women with, you know, musculature, like clear musculature, um, ex showing um, strength that was probably beyond what their ability in terms of strength was. Um, I mean, these women were legitimately lifting. If you watch the montage that I but that is in the PowerPoint, um, you will see some amazing feats that these women were able to do. What they're lifting, I mean, lifting men, multiple men at one time, um, um, lifting horses, you know, uh, just weights that just seem not humanly normal. Like, it just doesn't seem humanly possible. Um, and these women, you know, looking not massive, but you can tell they're strong, they're fit, um, and obviously they've trained to be able to do some of these amazing feats. Um, so... You know, they oftentimes, you know, I think it's interesting because oftentimes strong women, when they're described as, they're described as Amazonian, Amazonian, like Amazonian like. Um, so, of course, that sort of uh, is a reflection of what we've learned about with the Amazon women um, and their influence as a symbol of, of female strength. Um, and so I think it's kind of a neat connection that these strong women oftentimes were described as Amazonian women. Um and, you know, and that there was this shift in what men found sexy in women because they thought these women, there was quite a bit of sex appeal in them. And, of course, they kept the women looking what we would sort of classify as traditionally feminist, feminine, um, because you, you'll you notice, like, again, in the slideshow and even just the images that are on your PowerPoint, um, the sort of more... Um, skimpy outfits um you know they're very uh you know revealing in terms of showing a lot of skin um they're not wearing a ton of clothing um they're wearing shoes that i mean i wouldn't typically think of if you're doing something physically active especially like sh something considered like strong um strength defying uh, strength defying um some of them wear heels um their hair is done up some wearing hats or some things in their hair i mean they're wearing outfits that are not sort of your traditional garb when you're doing something physically active. Um, so, you know, definitely they kept these women, um, what we, again, what we consider sort of your stereotypical feminine, um, while they were doing what is stereotypical masculine in terms of their strength that they're displaying. Um, so, you know, the different women, um, Athleta probably she was the Belgium strong woman. She's probably she was probably the richest, most well known, most well sort of traveled. Um, you know, Sanwina who was German. Um, her parents were well known lifters. These are all things that you should have learned and read about in the articles that you read. Um, and then Volcana who was Irish. Um, she. Um, you know, wanted to have her own sort of like stage set um for her her um, performances and her competitions she she really is someone uh, the strong woman was known to try to retain her sort of beauty her girlish beauty her female beauty um but all of these women were sort of model feminist right because they championed um that again that strength that was sort of not traditional in what how we thought about women um but they also did want to keep sort of that, you know, kind of nice, pretty quality to them as well. So they sort of have this juxtaposition of what we typically would see as not a common combination. Um, so this pretty, uh, pretty presentation and really strong, um, you know, masculine effort when it came to how they performed their athletic feats. Um, so, 
you know, they they often performed in sort of the vaudevillian um, setting. Um, they started to perform all over the place. Like, they were traveling. I mean, these women really made a mark in terms of what women could do, not only just physically, but then how and where they performed, um, drawing crowds, drawing crowds of men and women, um, you know, appealing to a wide variety of people, uh, and sort of making money doing it. Like, that was a whole nother level of... Um, accomplishment as well. So the strong women were really a phenomenal um, accomplishment and pretty, a well, pretty cool piece of history when we look at like women athletes and accomplishments because of what they were able to do, not just physically what they were able to do, but in terms of entertainment, being paid for what they did physically, that was a pretty um, amazing and novel concept as well. Um, so again, you can take a look at the photo montage. I think that's a pretty cool thing to look at because you get to see all these images of different strong women and they are all legitimate women who are documented as strong women um, that that uh, did did these sort of performances like Athleta, um, uh, Volcana, and Sanwina did. So um, take a little break and then when you come back, you'll have your second video um, ready to go for you and we'll talk about early influences on um, early activities in women's recreational behaviors in America.